All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. I'm Cinnamon Carlarn. I'm one of the co-chairs of the International Environmental Law Interest Group. I want to welcome you to our discussion today on the topic of reforming international environmental law for the Anthropocene. Uh, before we dive in, I wanna say a huge thank you to all the folks at ASIL who have worked so hard to make sure that we can carry through with these conversations. Uh, very important to have these conversations during these challenging times. I also want to say thank you to Intersentia Publishing, who is uh, helping sponsor this talk as well as the environmental track. So uh, thank you for their support and thank you to all the folks at ASOL. Um, now, let me briefly introduce our panelists today before setting the scene for our conversation. So our panelists include uh, Professor Deepa Bhadranarayana, who I will uh, say a bit more about in just one moment, uh, Mr. Jan Aguila, and uh, Professor Louis Kotza. Um, we were also supposed to be joined by Ms. Carla Garcia Zendejas, who is the Director for People, Land, and Resources Program, uh, the program at the Center for International Environmental Law, but unfortunately due to the, the organizing, she wasn't able to join us. Um, so we will miss her voice and we hope to bring it back in at a later time. Now, let me just say a little bit about each of our panelists. Um, so you have a little bit more um, about their backgrounds. So Professor Badra Narayana is a professor at Chapman Law School. Um, she's also been a visiting scholar at the Center for Global Legal Studies at Columbia Law School and a consultant on the United Nations Global Compact. Uh, before coming to the U U United States, Professor Badra Narayana was a research officer for, a gov uh, for the government of India um, on the World Bank Environmental Capacity Building Project. Um, and she was also uh, worked at the National Law School of India University. Um, she's also she's been a part of a team that advised the government of India on its new legislation to manage biomedical waste. Uh, she holds an LLM in environmental law from Pace Law School um, and a degree from the National Law School of India. Um, she's also a member of the World Conservation Union uh, Committee on Environmental Law and serves as a chair of the AALS section of, on law and South Asian studies. Um, and she's written, written very widely in the area of international environmental law, including some really excellent comparative work, um, which I'm sure she'll draw on today. Um, our, um, our next speaker um, is Louise Kotza, who is a research professor of law at the Faculty of Law at Northwest University, South Africa, uh, where he teaches international and Africa, um, African regional environmental law in their LLM program. He's also a senior professional fellow in earth system law at the University of Lincoln in the UK. His research broadly encompasses three interrelated themes that he approaches from a transnational perspective. These include human rights, socio-ecological justice and environmental constitutionalism. Um, and of course, it's written very widely in law in the Anthropocene and Earth System Law, um, which will be part of our discussion today. He has published widely, including um, some recent books on human rights in the environment, global environmental constitutionalism in the Anthropocene, um, and sustainable development. Um, and last but not least, we have Jan Aguila, who is a professor at Sciences Po Perry and partner in a law firm in Paris at Brennan Park where he's head of the firm's public law practice. Uh, prior to joining the bar, he was a judge at the French Administrative Supreme Court. He also acted as advisor to the president of the Republic of Senegal. Um, he teaches public law and global environmental governance. Um, and he is also the chair of an environmental com commission and a think tank in France. And he has also written widely in this area. And he's also been very, very involved in the recent discussions on the global pact for the environment, which he will bring into our discussion today. So now that we know who our panelists are and um, know a little bit about our conversation, I just wanna say a little bit about what we're here to talk about before then opening up the Florida discussion. So we are all of course very well aware that these are challenging, um, very disruptive times in the world. Um, it's a time when we face multiple overlapping challenges that require us to confront societal, institutional, um, and personal weaknesses and vulnerabilities, um, but also our capacity for resilience and change. Um, and this is, of course, a very different world today um, than the one that the roundtable conversation was first envisioned as taking place in. But if anything, that makes the discussions we're having here today more relevant. Because, of course, we now find ourselves living in a period of abrupt change, and we're experiencing very vividly how this abrupt change ripples along existing pathways of disparity and inequality, exposing them and deepening them as it goes, and also really challenging us to think about our institutional structures and capacity. Um, so this is the context within which we're now operating and within which we now have this conversation. Um, but of course, in the field of environmental law, and in particular in international environmental law, 
um, we've been aware of and thinking about patterns of slow and sudden change in the relationship between patterns of environmental degradation and economic, social, and political conditions as they interplay with the rule of law for many years. This has always been the context within which we have operated. Um, now, seeing these relationships, especially at the global level and in the context of processes, patterns, and implications of globalization, uh, international law has always been and continues to be a site of robust normative development and institutional innovation. Yet, despite this innovation, despite this uh, development, we continue to face a deepening uh, suite of a de deepening and really expanding suite of potentially uh, devastating environmental challenges, from the unparalleled loss of biodiversity to the mounting problems uh, with toxic waste in our air, water, and our bodies, uh, to of course climate change. The list is long, and all of these problems intersect. They intersect with one another. They intersect with inequality, with other challenges to our social and legal systems, including, of course, the COVID nineteen pandemic and our legacies of racial injustice that we're dealing with in the United States and around the world as well. Now again, against this backdrop in the field of international environmental law, we continue to see growth and innovation and ingenuity and, and in how we tackle these challenges. Um, and that is really the topic of our discussion today, is the state of the field of international environmental law. What are the challenges that we are confronting in the Anthropocene? How have those challenges been exacerbated by recent events? And what are the key trends that we see and that we can see as hopeful moving forward. Now, with that little bit of backdrop and scene, I really want to turn over the floor now to Professor Louis Kotza, who can help us sketch out a little bit more about this complex and evolving terrain that is international environmental law. Thank you very much, Cinnamon. I think you've said it all, basically, what I wanted to say. But um, if I might add to that, I find it extremely useful um, in my own research and when I work with my students and other colleagues to try and relook really at international environmental law through the lens of the Anthropocene, um, which is, of course, the most recent geological epoch where humans are thought to have become an Earth system altering geological force, very much in the same way as volcanoes and earthquakes um, are able to alter the course of the Earth system. Now, the imagery of the Anthropocene, I think, breeds very starkly to the fore, the possibility of a human-induced mass extinction uh, on Earth, and certainly the potential for the loss of Earth system resilience, and a host of uncertainties that go to the very core uh, of existence of all life on Earth in an anthropogenically altered human-dominated Earth system. Um, and I think what this tells us, certainly, is that the current world order is characterized by short-termism, egocentric self-satisfaction, and unrestricted consumption and growth at the expense of the marginalized and oppressed human and non-human world on which it depends to sustain its ultimately unsustainable metabolism. And it is very worrying and the, the worrying degree of denialism and blatant rejection of the severity of the social ecological crisis the world over is also fueled by the rise of post-truth politics and extremist populism, radical anti-rationalism, and a sweeping rejection of rational science and the rule of law, as I think is increasingly evident, among many other examples, in Donald Trump's administration. So certainly a defining feature of the Anthropocene is also climate change and probably one of its more popular and better known manifestations, as well as the complexly entwined patterns of injustice that climate change highlights. Um, and the climate crisis is essentially a crisis of human hierarchy, as my colleague and friend Anna Greer always says. And it is one of global, global unevenness characterized by the many often hidden dynamics of privilege and oppression. So climate injustice in the Anthropocene, I believe has many faces ranging from global inequity within and between countries, corporate exploitation at the cost of the most vulnerable and practices of ecocide aimed at vulnerable non-human beings. 
um, and the deeply intertwined and mutually reinforcing practices of legally sanctioned, and this is important, legally sanctioned extractivism, mining, colonialism, imperialism, industrialization, and slavery, all exemplars of modern progress, to be honest, have been identified also as key drivers of the Anthropocene and as generators of multiple injustices and vulnerabilities. So before we move on, I just want to see if I can uh, get you to say a little bit more about two points. The first is what, and it's, it's a big question really, but just a frame for what does this mean for international environmental law as kind of an institution? Um, because really what we're thinking about is kind of the crumbling of, of the base. Um, does this mean that we need to decenter it more? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? That's an absolutely great question. And I think this is the one of the questions that, that we try to explore through the ring, through the new lens of system law. Um, how could one rethink international environmental law along the earth system metaphor, which one sees through the Anthropocene? Um, and we don't have solutions yet to this ultimately profound question you are posing. But I think the first step in getting there is to uh, identify the shortcomings and the contribution of international environmental law to the Anthropocene's global social ecological crisis. And I think the often neglected, but deeply implicated in these factors that play a role in the Anthropocene's global, social, ecological, and climate crisis is international environmental law. In other words, what I'm saying is that international environmental law is not always the solution that we think it is. It is also sometimes contributing to the problem. And the solutions that we often design by way of international environmental law is not sufficient, as you've also pointed out in your first remarks. And one of the issues that I've been struggling, for example, with is international environmental law's lack of normative ambition. States do not seem willing and able to make ambitious norms that also embrace deep ecological concerns, also of the non-human world and of especially vulnerable people, to try and achieve the deep structural transformations that we would need to address multiple injustices that we witness in the Anthropocene. Um, so we need to acknowledge that international law, international environmental law has been and continues to be complicit in causing, sustaining and exacerbating all of these injustices that we are talking about. If not always explicitly, then certainly in subtle, but no less disturbing ways through its promotion of those deeply structural paradigms that underlie climate injustice. And there's three that we can speak about perhaps a bit later on. Um, there's others, but for present purposes, I can imagine to focus on international environmental laws, full embrace of new liberal anthropocentrism. In other words, international environmental law is not always ecologically protective. The second one is international environmental laws, deep entanglement with concepts of colonialism and now new colonialism. And finally, international environmental laws entrenchment and full support of state sovereignty and the sovereign right to exploit environmental resources. And I'm happy to say something about these three a bit later on. Yes, well, hopefully we will come back to each of those. I mean, I think that you're right, and it's absolutely important to get out front this notion of the subordination, subordinating capacity of international environmental law itself. So even as we think about international environmental law as a tool for addressing subordination and injustice, of course, it's kind of perpetuating those patterns at the same time. Um, and I want to come back maybe a little bit later to think about the tensions between an earth system frame and anthropocentrism generally, and thinking about how to work through those and also you know, what role the rule of law plays when the rule of law can be both powerful and of course, of course also the darling of the elites. Um, but maybe before we come back to some of those topics, I wanna um, turn the flo floor over to um, Mr. Yanagila to talk a little bit about uh, the global pact for the environment and how those conversations arose and maybe how they're intersecting with some of the, the challenges in the frame that we heard Professor Kotza lay out for us. 
um, and also just a little bit about what role you're playing in, in those conversations. Yes, so thank you. Thank you very much, first of all, for uh, this uh, invitation. I'm very pleased to exchange with uh, Louis Cotze and, uh, and Deepa. Thank you uh, to, to you, Cinnamon and uh, uh, ACIL. Um, yes, I, I'm going to uh, present the initiative of the Global Pact. I'm going to focus on, on this uh, issue with uh, more or less two or three points. What is the pact? Why do we need a pact? And uh, maybe as a conclusion, what is the current status of the negotiation? So first point, what is uh, the Global Pact? The idea is very simple. The idea is uh, to have a short text, a kind of founding text that recognize human rights in the field of environment. Not only rights, uh, also duties, rights and duties toward nature. And uh, for comparison, uh, you have this kind of funding text in the field of environment, uh, and of, uh, sorry, of um, uh, human rights with uh, the Universal Declaration of 1948, and more than that, with the two international covenants of 1966. As the uh, a reminder, we used to say that there are three generations of human rights. The first one is uh, the, the basic uh, civil and political rights, the right to vote, uh, freedom of speech, etc. And these rights are recognized at the international level in the first international covenant on civil and political rights of 1966. The second generation of rights are social and economic rights, rights to health, important now, uh, the rights to education, etc. And these economic and uh, uh, social rights are recognized in the second international covenant on uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. And no, we think that it is time to have a third covenant, a third pact, the global pact for the environment. But this idea is not a new idea. Uh, what is very interesting to, to note is that for the past 30 years, the past 30 years, international legal experts have been asking for such a test. In 1987, you find this idea in the Brundtland Report. In uh, 1995, the IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, proposed a draft international covenant for the environment. And finally, in 19, in sorry, 2017, an international network of experts with around 100 experts the, uh, proposed a global pact for the environment. And after that, uh, the President Macron uh, proposed this idea to the uh, UN. And now the negotiations are, uh, I'm going to come back to this point, um, are ongoing to, to the UN. So we can say that uh, this idea, this idea to have a founding text recognizing all the right, the founding principle in the field of environment is not a new idea. And more or less the adoption of a kind of global pact would be the logical outcome of the 50 years of international environmental law. That is for what is uh, the, the pact. Why? No, my second point. Why do we need a pact? There are many reasons, but I'm just going to mention two of them. First reason, there is a lack. This kind of text does not exist. Uh, if you have a look on the situation in international law, first, you have many declarations, Stockholm declarations, the Rio declarations, but this declaration have no legal value. As a lawyer, I cannot invoke these declarations 
before court. After that, in the field of environmental law, international environmental law, you have treaties, you have many treaties. But these treaties have two features. First, they are sectorial, and second, they are technical. First, they are sectorial. For example, the Paris Agreement, which is a very huge, very important treaty. The Paris Agreement deals only with one issue, the climate change. And you have all the treaties, you have one treaty for one, each issue, one treaty, one issue, one issue, one treaty. You have treaty for forest, one another for biodiversity, for waste, for chemical, it's, it's very sectorial. It's incredible, but for the moment, there is no treaty about the environment as a whole. And everything is interconnected in the environment. So first, they are sectorial. Second, they are very technical. For example, I have to try to read the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is very technical. It's very important, again, but it's more or less impossible to read for a, a citizen. It's about uh, climate change. That means it's about gas emissions, about CO2. Uh, this kind of treaties are not made for citizens. They are made for states, maybe for engineers, but not for citizens. And the law is made for citizens. We must not forget that. That is why, that is why we, I think we need a single text accessible to citizens. You know, this kind of text that you can put on the wall of classrooms. And there is a lack, it is my first point, there is no text uh, like that. Second reason, this kind of text, of founding text, is very useful in the law. It's, it's not theoretical. Uh, it could have a very deep, very concrete impact in the law. I don't want to be too long, but we can mention the example of, in Europe, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights, which had a very deep impact on legal systems in Europe. And you have in America the Inter-American Inter Convention on Human Rights. This kind of founding text have two concrete consequences. The first is a, a dynamic in law, because lawmakers have to enact, to uh, concretize principle and to adopt new laws. Second impact, in dynamic, uh, a dynamic in jurisprudence for courts. To give you an example, um, a concrete example, uh, if a company pollutes your land, and if you want to sue this company in court, you need a legal basis. I speak as a lawyer, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and for example, you could argue that the polluter violates your rights, but what right? The right to a healthy environment. But the issue is that the right to a healthy environment is not often recognized in domestic law. That's why the pact could recognize, for example, it's an example among other, uh, the, this right, the right to a healthy environment, and it could be invoked by citizen before court. It depends, it's a little bit complicated, it depends on each country, in monist countries, like in France, you can invoke this kind of treaties before court. In other countries, uh, it could be at least a, a source of inspiration. That's and it for the- I don't want to interrupt you there, but I want to, um, I, I, have a, I have a suspicion that we're gonna have um, some differing opinions on whether or not this represents a normative ambition of the kind that Professor Kotze was suggesting and also kind of the way in which the global pact interacts with increasing concerns about human rights projects and the anthropogenic nature of, of international environmental law. But, but briefly before we kind of open some of those questions up and rupture some of these possible uh, 
uh, differences in terms of thinking about the role of the Global Pact. I want to ask uh, Professor Bajanayana to talk a little bit about uh, some of what we're seeing here, which is the, the rights turn in international environmental law, the way that rights are being evoked, and what, you know, what that looks like side of these kind of high level discussions, perhaps. Thank you so much. So I think it's a, a, a great segue. I think uh, both Louis and Jan have, uh, you know, mentioned or touched on um, aspects that I think really segue to some of the points I'm going to make. Uh, but before I start, I just wanted to thank you, Cinnamon, for uh, hosting this and for inviting me to be part of this roundtable. It's really uh, wonderful to be part of this conversation. Uh, and thanks to ASUL, of course, for uh, being flexible and organizing uh, this uh, in this format instead of canceling. Uh, the entire conference. So um, with that, so I guess what I'm going to do is I've been uh, in trying to, uh, uh, I'm going to try to tie together some of the uh, points that have been raised both by Louis and Dion. Um, and I think notably two points. The first point uh, that Louis raised is one of um, the normative structure we have in place and the problem of sovereignty. Uh, how can we actually accommodate rights um, within this normative structure? And Jan's point about making um, international law, particularly international environmental law and treaties accessible to people. So the overwhelming theme here is where are the people in this conversation? And I think public international law has been um, so much about states. It's been primarily about states that what we are seeing now um, is, is this uh, craving for space where people can actually step in. Um, and as Jan mentioned, that has happened at the regional level to some extent, uh, and particularly in the um, uh, European human rights context, the question is how do we accommodate that and expand that in the international environmental co uh, law context broadly. So what I want to do today to add to this conversation is talk about um, a little bit of the past and a little bit of the present and tie them together to make the argument uh, that introducing uh, the norm of human rights to counterbalance uh, the problems or the challenges of sovereignty um, is not something new that we've seen this as a, we are in a moment of evolution uh, that has been occurring for several centuries and that we need to really um, see this as a defining moment with so many things happening, but particularly in the context of climate change to harness all those developments and translate it into a more right focus uh, format. So let me begin first with the present very quickly, go to the past and come back to the present. Um, and so the present is that um, we've been seeing a lot of um, uh, human rights or right-based litigation occurring in different jurisdictions um, on the matter of climate change. So uh, starting with uh, cases, initial cases that were raised be before um, regional bodies like the Organization of American States, um, and then on to the more um, uh, domestic level, we've seen people actually challenging uh, the position of their countries or their governments in regard to climate change mitigation and even adaptation. And we saw with the uh, Urhenda case, a really defining moment when the um, court found that well, this is a matter of rights and people's rights will be affected. Um, and I'm not capturing the entire Urhenda case since that's not the discussion here, but I think there is a really important uh, turning point. And what we have seen over the past uh, couple of uh, years is an emergence, a very strong, robust emergence of a rights-based challenge to climate action in the domestic courts. And we can see this occurring both in developed countries and in developing countries, um, where, whether, the, whether the challenge is about um, embracing uh, greater emissions reduction goals or meeting adaptation goals. Uh, people have been challenging the governments to do something. And I think this is a very important development, especially if you take into account uh, you know, the network theory and those forms of theories where we can see uh, domestic action percolating into the international sphere simply by creating a conversation and synergy where the governments take a similar position throughout. So it, it does feed into that kind of synergy. And I think it's a very important way in which rights can get embedded um, uh, you know, at the domestic level and percolate into the international level and back. Uh, to some extent, we see that with the Paris Agreement for the first time uh, using the language human rights within the preamble. Um, so I think that percolation has occurred. But there is still a big challenge, right? And the big challenge is this, that 
what if there is a very powerful government? When I say powerful, um, maybe that's a wrong word. Uh, a, a very influential government, perhaps, is a better word. Um, and by which I mean, what if there's a government that is critical or whose participation is critical to reduce emissions, but that government decides, I'm not going to do anything. I, 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 I'm I, not going to take this on. And we've seen this in the context of the United States, um, where despite the Juliana case where, uh, you know, youth plaintiffs presented a case for uh, their rights to be protected, um, when that got dismissed, and when you have a government that is not willing to undertake emission reduction goals, we are stuck in that very same normative uh, you know, trap where sovereignty trumps over um, the rights of people and what impacts a particular problem might have on the rights of people. So the question is, where do we go from here? And so I think normatively, the challenge is really to kind of say, how do you counterbalance that sovereignty? And so that's that's like, who's going to bell the cat when the cat holds the bell, right? So, uh, the, you know, we are in this really great problem. But I, what I would like to do now is kind of turn quickly to the past and talk about why, drawing from lessons in the past, we should con con you know, continue to press forward to see how we can actually bring the rights framework um, into the international sphere and make it stronger. And the past is really one of uh, British colonization in India that I want to briefly mention. Um, and before I start, you know, um, my, you know, make my points, points about that, uh, I want to clarify, this is not a apology for the British colonization, this is not an endorsement of British colonization, but rather the attempt here is to see how did rights emerge um, in British India, um, and what does that tell us? So uh, I've been doing some work um, in this regard, and what has been interesting for me to note um, are two things. The first is, um, you know, the, the, the British um, uh, government, right, or the uh, people in power in uh, uh, Old Britain um, did not treat their own people too well, right? So it's not as if everyone in Britain was treated very nicely and there was no upstairs, downstairs kind of situation. What we see is that there was really a liberal rights um, movement that occurred in Britain, um, and that reflects on how the state powers had to be balanced, right? Starting from Magna Carta all the way down um, to the era when the uh, British um, began colonization in different parts of the world. What we see is the same kind of um, uh, patterns of um, behavior that are not uh, just and people friendly uh, occurring in Britain and also outside of Britain, supported by uh, you know a, a, a group of uh, those in power, right, or the government or the crown, um, and I use that loosely. Um, so what happens next is in India particularly, and I know the experiences of different countries might be different, and so I'm not trying to uh, pack them together, but just in the context of Britain, what I've been noticing is the um, uh, introduction of rights in India really uh, began in the modern sense when a lot of Indians went to Britain um, and got educated in Britain. So Gandhi was a lawyer educated in Britain. Nehru was uh, educated in Britain. So a lot of the freedom fighters really brought in the language of rights that had evolved in, British, in, 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 in Britain and brought them back. And you see a lot of support from a lot of Britishers in, uh, in Britain being against colonization, being against the East India Company's policies. So what does this mean normatively? I think the point, um, the normative point I think we can draw from all of this is that rights has been, or rights have been per percolating for a long time now. They've been moving around. Um, and if we use again the network theory, what we can see is this networks of rights have been uh, forming even during the colonial era. Um, and quite apart from their cultural implications, quite apart from the various you know, disadvantages of converting to the language of uh, rights um, in this particular fashion, the fact remains that this is where we are today. Many of the colonized or pre-colonized um, countries have constitutions that are actually based on the rights um, philosophy that is drawn from a Western liberal philosophy of rights. But it's glaringly absent in the international law context. And that is the real normative challenge that we have, which is how is it that we have slowly managed to erode uh, the absolute supremacy of sovereignty in the domestic, domestic context, um, but not in the international context? And how do we get there? How do we actually uh, introduce or balance sovereignty in the international context? And, and, and the only way really to do this, if you draw from domestic context, is by making rights, individual rights, uh, much more important and much more enforceable 
um, and much more, uh, you know, or, or put it on an equal uh, footing with sovereignty. And I think coming back quickly to the present again, I think this is already occurring to some extent when we see constitutions uh, being invoked and constitutions that are based on principles uh, set out in the Universal Declaration of Uni uh, Human Rights and other human rights um, uh, uh, documents. So there's already been you know, influence of the international human rights language into the domestic context. Now the question is, can we bring it back into the international context, but a with a little bit more oomph so that you know, we can actually say we need enforcement. And I think we have that in the context of the uh, European Human Rights uh, um, uh, uh, Agreement Treaty and also the code, uh, but how do we actually um, expand that experience is where I think we should focus on. And uh, a short suggestion, I suppose everybody can make a suggestion, but I think um, I, I'm, I, I'm being uh, you know, optimistic about this, but I think these conversations and the fact that you have a global pact, the fact that we have more um, you know, focus on introducing the rights framework into the uh, conversation could actually eventually result in having some form of enforceable rights instrument. Uh, but I think we really need to think about that framework. How do we establish something um, in the international, at the international level where people have a footing and not states only? Be because we cannot always depend on states to represent the best interests of their own people or people in general. Um, I'll start there and you know, look forward to more conversation among us. Uh, we cannot hear you. Thank you. <laughs> That's a perfect segue for returning to some of the questions that Louise sketched out at, at the very beginning and then trying to think about those as they intersect with the global pact. So, you know, thinking, and Louis, maybe I'll invite you to share your thoughts with us on really kind of the relationship between the rights framework as it's evolving, whether it's human rights or global environmental constitutionalism, maybe we can think about the constitutional rights as well, um, and whether or not this kind of rights-based framework, which of course is deeply anthropocentric, really whether it embodies the kind of normative ambition that we need in the international environmental context, um, and what the relationship really is and can be between really pushing forward a rights-based framework that comes from emerges from colonialism when we are trying to perhaps uh, release some of the, the tightness that state sovereignty continues to hold um, on all of these efforts. And Louis, I'll, I'll invite you to start there. Thank you, Cinnamon. Well, this is... This is I think you absolutely nail it when you when you kind of question the um, the potential suitability of human rights within this entire endeavor. And I mean, I I, I fully sympathise with both Deepa and with Jan in their emphasis on using human rights and their potential to to kind of uh, 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 make the transformation happen that we need. But I think we also need to be realistic. Um, Speaking from my own country's perspective, we have a very modern Bill of Rights um, that was introduced under the Nelson Mandela government. But if you look at South Africa today, uh, even if, even despite the fact that it is a constitutional state, not much has changed. So human rights in themselves on paper tells us very little. Um, and I'm, I tend to be also a bit more, more, more skeptical about the positive effects that human rights could have, specifically on the environmental crisis. I do recognize that they are hugely important symbolically, that they could mobilize, as we are seeing, for example, currently in the debates happening in the US and the, and the kind of rights-based momentum that is happening there, which is amazing and wonderful and inspiring. But I often wonder what the practical value of human rights really is. Um, and I do not know whether such a study has yet been done, and I would love to hear if it is, but has anyone measured um, whether there is a direct correlation between the enactment of environmental human rights and the improvement of environmental quality? It's obviously a very difficult thing to measure, but I think in some, and I'll keep it short, one should not overstate the 
um, the practical value, at least, of human rights. And that is why I've tried also in some of my recent work is to try and look at the human predicament or the uh, environmental predicament, which also includes non-humans, through the lens of vulnerability, where something uh, with reference to the work of Anna Greer and Marta Feynman, for example. Vulnerability tells us we are all vulnerable in the Anthropocene. Some are just more vulnerable than others. The Earth system itself is vulnerable. And we would need to design laws, whether they are human rights or something such as the Global Pact, which is meant to be a global framework treaty that recognizes this vulnerability, that brings humans back into the Earth system and makes them part again of not an environment out there that we use for our benefit as a resource, but something that we feel ethically deep and care about. Um, and I suspect that movements towards recognizing the rights of nature, for example, is a step in the right direction. Again, the questions of enforceability, practical utility of the rights of nature come to the fore, and that's all questionable, and we can talk about this for hours. Uh, but again, symbolically, I think it is a way of recognizing how the law can structurally change, and I go back to my introductory comments, to become more caring, to recognize and fully embrace the vulnerability concerns of the entire living system, especially that of a very vulnerable, increasingly vulnerable, non-human living world and of the billions of vulnerable human beings living on Earth, especially in the global South, in Africa, in India, in South America, in Asia, and so forth. So recognizing um, our time limits, I wanted to ask, actually ask Jan and Deepa to both respond as well. And Jan, perhaps I can ask you to um, speak to whether within the Global Pact conversations there have been any discussions about rights for nature, concerns about you know, embedding hierarchies or, you know, kind of a, the, the Western nature of the approach or whether um, there's a general acceptance that a human rights frame that is cohesive is, is simply the way to go. Yes, maybe, maybe we were. <coughs> um, first, I, I just want to um, uh, say that I, I, I think that we, we share many ideas with Louis Cotzer and uh, in particular, I think that um, the idea of uh, a global constitution. We need, I think, we need a global framework of, on the world. Um, and, um, you know, more or less the global pact is, uh, came from this idea, this kind of idea. The, the situation is that in international law, we have many technical, as I said, many technical law. It is like if in one country you have laws, technical law, but no constitution. We have no constitution. So it's this kind of idea. Second part, I, I want to uh, uh, confirm, as uh, Deepa said, that um, um, I, I think that we need, maybe it's the way to uh, counterbalance the sovereignty of states, we need to give more power at the international level to citizens. Um, because uh, in the 19th century, uh, and no, uh, it's the same thing, more or less, um, we build international law. Uh, international law was built by states and for states, but we forget the citizen. And now it's time to put the citizen at the center of this idea, in particular with the field, in the field of uh, environment. And uh, regarding rights of um, nature, we can speak of hours about this uh, issue. You know, about the Global Pact, the, the content of the Global Pact is very open. Um, we wrote with 100 of experts a first draft, but it's very, very preliminary, preliminary draft. And uh, it's for me the opportunity to uh, give this precision. Uh, this uh, draft uh, is made to be amended, to be transformed. And for example, the issue of the rights of nature is a good example, but I can add also, uh, it's the same idea, the, the uh, rights of animals, hope to protect animals. 
and we have many other uh, issues that we can add in a global pact. I think now it's time, and maybe uh, it's the occasion to give the, the goal. Uh, we will have, in 2022, the next Earth Summit in Stockholm. It is called the Stockholm Plus 20, after the Stockholm Conference of 1972. And we know that uh, a text is going to be adopted. I don't know what kind of text, maybe a single declaration, maybe more, but we have two years to act. And I think that altogether, we have to make a pressure, a pressure on state to have an ambitious text and to discuss what kind of text. It could be the global pact or uh, whatever the name, it could be others, but all we have to think about uh, what kind of uh, legal form, treaty, declaration, and more, more than that, what kind of content. And the discussion is very open about the content, including rights of nature, why not? Thanks. And Diva, I don't know if you wanted to share your thoughts, perhaps at the intersection of uh, the empowerment of citizens and the, the, the role of rights in that regard, because of course that is part of the story you're telling about um, the education in Britain and bringing the rights back in and kind of building those powers into a system. And then of course the powers get captured. And so part of the story it sounds like you're telling is recapturing those powers and, and making them operate in different ways. And so I don't know if you had thoughts about that. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very uh, you know a nice way of putting that. Um, and I agree, right? I, I think, you know, uh, Louis points about rights of nature. I think it's so important. And I think, you know, I always think about, I think, was it Wicked, uh, in which you keep thinking that animals stop speaking because what was the point in speaking? And it always, you know, uh, is something I think about. And I think if we respected nature, we wouldn't have probably any of these problems, right? Uh, we would be just fine. That would be the best uh, way to go. But here we are. Um, so the question is in our constructive world, we have made certain uh, normative constructs, we have certain legal constructs. And the question is, you know, how do you whittle away at constructs that are, you know, uh, damaging uh, to the environment, uh, but also creating um, injustices uh, to a smaller number or a, or a group of people? Um, and how do you actually address that? And I think the human rights approach would be one way to begin whittling away the problem. And the goal, I suppose, you know, I agree with Louis, it's not going to solve everything. Um, it has its own inherent problems, right? The rights language which has had its own inherent problems and that'll remain. But I think when you, when you use it as a counterbalance against sovereignty, you can achieve some kind of uh, power balance um, and that power balance might actually help us move closer to the bigger goal of encompassing rights of uh, nature, rights of uh, animals, uh, rights uh, of the environment for what it is. Um, and very quickly, a second point, I thought Louis made a very um, interesting point about um, uh, you know, do we have uh, quantitative uh, data and evidence about how rights can uh, improve? Um, and I think I would say this, like I don't have, you know, this is the quantitative data, but what I would say is if you look at the environmental justice movement in different parts of the world, I think what we can probably gather from that is evidence uh, perhaps that if we were careful about which communities bore the burden of environmental harm and pollution, and if their rights were actually um, given voice and enforced, maybe what we would see is some form of balancing that will occur, right? So one of the problems is externalities that we have where you can just uh, you know, ignore rights of some people, you can just take a bunch of pollution and put it in, uh, in another country or another neighborhood. And so you never take into account um, you know, the rights of those people. And so the economic basis for all the development is built on that flawed system that you, know, you don't have to take into account the rights of other people. And I think the rights language might actually help that. Um, and I think this is not new. We've used rights from the period of colonization to kind of push back against uh, you know, as Cinnamon, uh, you know, correctly, uh, um, you know, said uh, power uh, capturing that's taking place or that has uh, taken place over the centuries. So I think that's the limited role. It won't be the perfect solution, but I think normatively it's one of the you know counterbalancing that we can um, do by introducing rights. And I completely agree with Jan that you know as we move uh, towards our next Stockholm uh, conference, if we actually start thinking about well, you know, we we respect why states have sovereignty, we respect why 
Now, you know, they lead the conversation, right? Especially in light of colonization, um, where sovereignty becomes very important to reiterate because of the colonial past. Um, it's equally important to uh, recognize that ultimately, um, you know, it was about people, right? It was not about colonization was not only state versus state, it was about people at the end of the day um, against certain states as well. And I think if we, uh, you know, use that as, you know, bring that into the conversation, we might probably have um, a little bit more, uh, you know, progress into balancing the kind of power structures that are in place. It's not going to be perfect. I look at this as a lifelong project for many uh, generations to come. Uh, so it's not going to just get achieved, but I think we need to kind of carve out the paths that the future generations can walk on um, to achieve a more just society. Thanks, Deepa. So our last few minutes, I want to just kind of invite you all to um, offer perhaps a one minute blurb is the kind that politicians might hear. And the, so to, for a little bit of context, of course, with the pandemic, um, we are living in times where we see that our interconnectedness is, is deeply real and it is both our greatest strength and our greatest weakness. Um, and as we seek to kind of rebuild from the pandemic and think about, you know, the concept of building back better, recovering and rebuilding, um, thinking about environment, environmental degradation, climate change really must be part of that process because we need to see that disasters and humans are all interconnected. Um, and so in this moment in time, um, I would really invite each of you, you know, just in a minute or so to think about what reform you would really think is the most important in international environmental law that you would like to have as part of those conversations about recovering and rebuilding um, as we move forward, because I think this is a time when those conversations are actually open and people are listening. And so um, perhaps Deepa, we'll start with you um, to kind of go in reverse order this time. You know, what, what is the message that you would want those in power to be hearing right now? Universalism, right? So um, universalism by which I mean that we are all in it together, that whatever systems we have in place, whatever agreements we put in place, based on uh, geographical boundaries and divisions just don't work, right? Nature knows no boundaries, right? And we share a common goal. And I think this is the message of environmental law, right? That this is one earth. And I would say to people, let's start there. Any pact, any measure we take, we are in it together. You know, and I'll end with, you know, the old uh, Sanskrit proverb that gets, or statement, you know, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the entire world is one, is a family. And that's the message I would have. Let's start our conversations with that in mind. Thanks. Jan, over to you. Maybe, maybe I think we, we have to, to, to give a thought to the decision-making power uh, process, decision-making process in the field of uh, international law. Because for the moment, the rule is the rule of consensus. And the consensus is interpreted like unanimity. And this is the source of the paralysis of the of failure of uh, Copenhagen, failure, for example, uh, or uh, the difficulty that uh, we are facing for the, regarding the global pact. I think that in a democracy, if you think an international democracy, there is a, a rule, the majority. I think that we have to to make this uh, decision-making process more efficient. And maybe the, the rule of, uh, of majority could be a game changer. Thanks, so. And Louis? I actually wanted to make so many points because the discussion is fascinating, but <laughs> I'll be very, very brief. I think just in reference again to what you said, Cinnamon, is that the COVID-19 pandemic, to me at least, shows many things, but one of the most important things is that states are in fact able to quickly and very thoroughly respond to a global crisis. And I think the extent of the interventions that we've seen suggests to me that all states across the world would be in a position and would be able to respond to the current socio-ecological crisis that we see in the, in the Anthropocene. They just must want to which brings us back to the consensus and the negotiations on the global pact and so forth. Um, a second point, I do not think we need to give people power. I think people are taking back power themselves. We see this in the Friday for Future movements. We see this what's happening in the streets of America as we speak here. 
all across the world. I think people are sick and bloody tired of being structurally oppressed in so many ways, economically, politically, environmentally, and so forth. Um, and finally, I hope that this would all culminate in a new legal paradigm for the Anthropocene, because I don't think international environmental law is sufficient anymore to address this. And I hope we can move towards a new form of what I would call Earth system law that hopefully could touch on all of these issues that all of you have mentioned. Thank you. I'll leave it there. So the consistent message I'm hearing from you is that in a time of great disruption, there's also great opportunity and that we're beginning to really see those opportunities and those possibilities. And so I want to thank each of you um, for engaging in this conversation and helping us push closer towards making those opportunities real. So thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.